turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, our text in, our text will be from verses 7 to 11. This is the word of God for us. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for, for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So what Paul is doing here in these verses is he's giving the Philippians an account of the intercessory ministry that he performs on their behalf. In verse 4, you might remember, he tells them that he had... Uh, as often as he prayed, he prayed for that church. And now he is getting more into the details here. He is telling them how he prays for them, how he intercedes for them before God. And to be sure, by interceding for these believers, Paul was only doing what the godly have always done. Godly people have always been intercessors before God on behalf of others. You can go back as far as Job, who himself was one who interceded for others. He was holding others in prayer. In fact, in Job chapter 1, it is stated that he prayed for his children. Verse 4, his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. In other words, his children would feast together. They would get to together and have these feasts at set times of the year. And after every feast was over, Job would then begin his work of intercession, lest in their fullness they had cursed God in their hearts. Also, at the end of this book of Job, you find that he is made to intercede for his foolish friends. In chapter 42, and verses 8 and 9, God says this, speaking to the friends, Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job will pray for you, for I will accept him, so that I may not do with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the the Temanite and Bildad, the Shuhite and Zobar, the Naamathite, went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job. So Job was an early saint, a godly man, whose role was to intercede. He prayed for others. The same thing we find in the life of Abraham. Of course, in Genesis 18, we find that he intercedes for the men of Sodom. Genesis 18, 22, Then the men turned away from there towards Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. 
far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So there you have Abraham interceding for the righteous within the city of Sodom. And uh, he continues, as you know, the rest of the story to intercede until he brings down the requirement of God to 10 righteous people in that city. And they would then be spared, but that doesn't happen. So the city is destroyed. Nevertheless, Abraham is one who intercedes. The same thing happens in Genesis 20. We find him interceding there for Abimelech who had taken Abraham's wife. And it says in verse 7, Now therefore, restore the man's wife. This is God speaking to Abimelech. For he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Down in verse 17, it says, Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his mates, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed past all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. This man had taken Abraham's wife, and God made all the women within his household infertile. And in order to be healed, Abraham had to return or uh, rather, Abraham had to receive his wife back and then pray for Abimelech's healing. In the same way, we find that Isaac prays for his son Jacob, although unknowingly, that he would carry the holy seed forward, the family forward. It gives him a blessing in his prayer. Then you find Jacob, his son, who at the end of his life blesses all of his sons. And so the patriarchs were... People who prayed for others. They were intercessors for others before God. This is one of their most important gifts of the fathers of the faith. What was some of, uh, one of the most important functions that they served? They interceded before God for other people. And they're not the only ones, of course. You move on to Exodus and you find that Moses prays repeatedly for God to spare Israel. When Israel, for example, sins with the golden calf... Uh, Moses stands as one who intercedes for the people. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 11 says this, Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, Oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to the people. He does that in the episode of the golden calf, he does it again several times, including, including when they reject the report of Caleb and Joshua who say, let's go turn and, turn and take the promised land. And the people of Israel say, no, we, are, we will be unable to take it. And God is about to destroy them. And Moses intercedes for them. So you have the patriarchs interceding, you have Moses interceding, Samuel, we can go on and on. Samuel says that if he does not pray for the people, that would be a sin to him. He's an intercessor for the people. David, we find in the book of Psalms, would even mourn over his enemies, praying to God for the healing and the well-being of his own enemies. And of course, he prays repeatedly for the righteous and then the Jews, actually, when they are being sent into captivity, what are they asked of God but to pray for their captors, to pray for the cities in which they live? Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7, a very well-known passage. But notice what is the role of God's people as they are sent into captivity. What are they to do? They are to intercede on behalf of those with whom they live. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 7, Seek the welfare of the city, said God to them, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. And so all throughout the, New the Old Testament, you find that the saints' role is, is to intercede. The saints are to pray for other people. And that doesn't end in the New Testament, of course, because we find that in Jesus himself, he is praying for his people. He prays that that Peter's faith would not fail when Satan sifts him like wheat. He prays in John 17 for the faith of his, the rest of his disciples and those who would believe and their unity. Then you move on to 
the church in Acts, and the church is found in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, praying earnestly that Peter would be released from jail. And then also James himself, who is writing to the Christians in Jerusalem, in the church in Jerusalem, he commands them, James chapter 5, verse 15, to pray for one another. And even at the end of the New Testament, the Apostle John is instructing believers, 1 John 5, 16, that when they see another believer, another believer sinning, pray for him. Pray that his sin would be forgiven. So it has always been a role of all the saints of God, of all the godly, to pray. To pray on behalf of others. And Paul, in our text, is simply telling them that he does that himself. That he follows and falls into that pattern of the godly throughout the ages. He has only one more. And he is uh, engaging in this on behalf of the Philippian Christians. Now, from his example here of intercession, the first thing that we can learn for ourselves as we intercede for others on their behalf is that we must intercede on their behalf according to God's will. According to God's will. Back in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7, this is what the Apostle Paul says. It is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. When he says it is only right, the word for right that he use, uses here is the same word that we translate as, as just. It is something that is in keeping with God's commandment. It is required of him that he has a certain opinion, he is saying here, about the Philippians, and that is uh, that God actually had begun the good work. We looked at uh, verse 6 last time, and in verse 6, he says, I am confident that you are in a state of grace. I am s confident and certain that you guys are truly saved, and you truly will be saved. He is confident in the salvation of the Philippians, and he says, it's right for me to feel confident about that salvation. Why? Why is it right for him to feel confident about the salvation of these saints, of this church? Well, on the one hand, love requires it. Love required it. Love, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, believes all things and hopes all things. Therefore, unless a man's life clearly contradicts what he professes with his mouth, and we are bound to believe the best concerning his eternal state and not be so much suspicious about whether everybody else is actually saved we need to believe to to we need to learn to believe the best of others and yet it's a balance while not turning blind eyes to glaring signs of hypocrisy we need to learn to believe the best because love does love requires us to do so and so paul was bound by love to believe the best of them, that they were going, they were true believers. But here's the other thing. In the case of the Philippians, not only did love require Paul to believe the best about their eternal state, but their lives, the very way that they, they were living their life was requiring Paul to feel confident about their salvation. He says in verse 7, Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. The heart, as we know, is the seat of the affections. And so to have somebody in your heart means that you, you hold that person with profound love. You love them. Now, why does Paul love the saints? Why is he saying that his heart is so tightly knit to theirs? And the reason is actually the same reason as to why he's so confident about their salvation. And that is that they had suffered with him. They had suffered with him. In my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. When Paul had been in prison and carried off to Rome in, to stand trial before Caesar, 
When he had been made to appear before the courts of the city magistrates and the governors and the religious leaders to provide a defense for the gospel, to provide a, a reason for the hope that was with him or what, that was hope, the hope that was in him, they all the while had been partakers of grace with him. In other words, they had been co-laborers with him in the ministry. They stuck by the apostle Paul when things got rough. When he was in prison, they were still praying for him. They were still sending support. They were still holding on to the same teachings and submitting to him. This is why in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, It was kind of you to share in my trouble. You have done well, he says, to share with me in my affliction. They entered into the affliction that Paul was enduring and this is why he was so confident about their salvation because when we suffer with other believers we demonstrate that we are one body with them that we are in the same body with them and that becomes powerful evidence of our own salvation this is voluntary suffering i could turn my, a blind eye and not care about what my brother or sister is going uh, is going through but why, how could I do that if I am in one body with them? This is uh, like having a stubbed toe and the mouth is smiling. It doesn't make sense. Or this is like having a broken arm and dancing feet. There's a disconnect if you are not suffering with those who suffer. You might remember that when Paul is persecuting the church, Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, Paul. Why are you persecuting me? He's the head. We are the body. To strike at the body is to strike at the head. When you get hit in your arm, you got hit. Not your arm, but you got hit. And so this is why we are told to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Because we are one body with them. And when we do, we provide powerful evidence of our own salvation. And so Paul, again, he is confident of this good work. Now, what is he going to pray for in our text? He is simply going to pray in verses, in verses uh, 9 and on that the good work would be completed. That the good work that was begun would be finished. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. In other words, God, please complete the work that you begun. And that means that when Paul is going to intercede for the saints in Philippi, he is seeking to intercede for what he knows God wants. He is seeking to pray for what he knows God wants. God had already begun a good work and had promised that he would finish it and Paul is saying, God, do as you promise. Do as you have demonstrated you want. And that teaches us that when we pray for others, we must pray according to the will of God. We must pray according to what God, we know that God wants of them. This is why Jesus himself said, not my will, but yours be done. And uh, 1 John Chapter 5 and verse 16 has an interesting scenario there because he says uh, the following If anyone, this is 1 John 5 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. Now, what is the sin leading to death? It is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it is not easy. In fact, some say it's impossible. I don't know that that is uh, true. But uh, uh, admittedly, it is quite difficult to know whether a person has actually blasphemed the Holy Spirit, has crossed the point of no repentance. And John is saying here, if you knew, if you happen to know that a person did blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you should not pray for them. That's what he's saying here. I am not saying that you should pray for one who has 
committed the sin leading to death. What's the point there? That you are always to pray according to the will of God. And if God has demonstrated and has said in His Word that someone who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit will not repent anymore, then it is not His will that that person should be saved, and therefore you don't pray for them. Again, the point here is not so much uh, that you are able to know always, but if you knew, you wouldn't pray. Because we always pray according to the will of God. There's a story of the minister who comes to the uh, mother whose child is about to die and he is sick. And the minister approaches the mother and prays that God would heal the child if it was his will. When he's done praying, the mother is enraged. How dare you? Simply pray that he would be healed, not healed if God wants. Pray that he would be healed. To which the minister replies, you will have what you want. You will have what you want. Your child will get better. And he walks away in anger. Later on, the child gets better and grows up. And as a young man, is executed as a murderer. Sometimes God answers prayers in wrath. When we insist, my way, my way, my way, God may answer in wrath and say, have what you want. So we pray according to what God wants. So, that means that there are some things that we should never pray for, right? There are some things that Christians ought never to pray for. If you know it's not God's will, why pray for it? I'll pray about dating this unbeliever. It tells you not to do it. Why should you pray for that? I'll pray for whether I should join this false church. It doesn't want you to do that. You don't need to pray about that. Don't do it. Just don't do it. You don't ever pray for something that you know is not God's will. That would be actually blasphemous. So we learn here that as he, Paul, as he is interceding, as he is praying for his fellow believers, he is praying according to God's will. But what else? He is uh, also praying as an extension of the love of Jesus. His, uh, our intercessions should simply be an intercession or, or an extension of the love of Christ. Verse 8 of Philippians 1, for, my, for God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Uh, the God is my witness bit, that's an oath. Perhaps there were some teachers going around Philippi and he knew that they had maybe already infiltrated the church or, or were wanting to. Uh, who would then cast doubt on Paul's love for these people. And now he is so using a, a note saying, God is my witness. God is my witness. I swear how I long for you all. The, the Greek expression here denotes earnestly desiring something. It means to yearn. I yearn for you all with the affection, not with, with some, not, not with some fleshly love, but with the affection of Christ Jesus. The word for affection here, uh, affection is the vows, the vows, which for the Hebrews was the seed of the more tender affections. This is kind of strange language for us. Uh, um, I love you with the vows of Jesus Christ. Very strange for us. But for them, that was the seed of the tender affections, the the kindness, the compassion, the tender heartedness of a father. And so the father, the, the, the love that Paul has for these people is fatherly, it's intense, but it's not from him. It doesn't originate from Paul, but rather it's simply a channeling of Jesus' love for them. Jesus loves his people with a fatherly love. He is prone to pity. Psalm 103, verse 13, that as a, says that as a father loves his children, so does the Lord feel compassion and pity for us. And then you might remember from his own parable of the prodigal son, he represents the father. And what does the father do when he sees the prodigal son coming back? He runs to him. 
He runs to his son in spite of his own shame and gets rid of the past and says, I don't care about what you did before. I don't care that you took the inheritance and that you, you left me for dead as if I had already died. I don't care about any of that. I love you. I want to forgive you. I want to receive you. This is how Jesus loves his people. And Paul is saying, this is the love that I have for you, not because it comes from me, but rather I have been united with Jesus. I am one with him. So that his own virtues and his own graces simply flow through me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so the good works of the Christian are the good works of Jesus. It is Jesus doing your works for you. You are simply the channel through which they pass. So if you're uh, praying for someone and you're not connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not plugged into the vine, you're not in union with Him, then what you're doing is not good. You're not good. In fact, you're actually sinning. Because impure people, they can't appear before the presence of a holy God to pray for somebody else. They can't appear at all in the presence of a holy God with impunity. If you're a slanderer, you're a gossip, you have an unclean mouth, you're impure, and God hates even your prayers. The prayer of the wicked is an abomination. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8 says, You say, well, then I won't pray anymore. And I say, that's sin too. That's atheism. That's refusing to acknowledge the God who made you. That's refusing to love neighbor. So instead, what do you do? You seek union with Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus so that you may be washed from all your filthiness and be made clean so that then you can appear as a priest before God and pray and intercede for others. You need to come to Christ. You need to lay down your idols and abandon your hope for saving yourself and your own love for those things that are not God and come to Jesus by faith and he will forgive you. And then you can get on the work of interceding. So come to Jesus Christ. Come. He is a good father, like the prodigal, the, son, the prodigal son's father, who will run to you. Who will run to you. He will receive you. No matter how unclean you may be, no matter how many bad things you've done, no matter, no matter how evil your heart is, and you can see that, and he will not accept me. Yes, he will. Come to Jesus. Come to him today and feast in his own goodness. So, having considered the requirements of intercession, I want to consider now the goal that we should have as we're praying for others. It's interesting. Paul doesn't really in this passage tell us precisely what to pray for or, or how to pray. He doesn't get into the particulars. But rather what he does is he tells us this is what you're, this is what you're looking for in the lives of other people. When you're going to pray for them, here's the goal that you should have in mind. Because if you have the goal right, you're going to get the specifics right. And so uh, that goal can be divided into three categories. Uh, on the one hand, we can think of it in, in terms of the things that a, a, a saint needs right now. The things that they will need down the line later. And the things that they will need ultimately. So let's think about the... What, what does the saint need right now? Verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. The, the, the verb to pray here is present, active, indicative. It means this is the ongoing pray, uh, prayer of Paul. This is what you're doing. This is what you're constantly doing as you're seeking God on behalf of, other, uh, of others. You're praying for them, and you're praying what? That their love may abound still more and more. Love. Love. Love is, as we know, the fulfillment of the whole law. The whole law hangs on two commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, love neighbor as yourself. The whole law is summarized in those two commandments. And what, what do they both have in common? Love. Love. And so love is the highest of all graces, the most important. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But now faith, hope, love, abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love, the highest of all graces. Every sin issue 
every problem that you have in your life can be boiled down to one thing, a lack of love. Always. Every problem that you face, boil it down to one thing, a lack of love. Love, love. If you have love, everything fixes itself. This is, by the way, why Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15 that the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure conscience. Right? What we're tr trying to accomplish as we preach the gospel, as we minister to others, as we in instruct, teach, what we're trying to accomplish is love in their life. And now he's revealing that the goal of our intercession, not just of our preaching, but the goal of our praying for others is love. Love is the highest of all the graces. And he says, I am praying that your love may abound still more and more. There's a heaping up of terms here to denote this idea of increasing. The word abound means to overflow. It's like a fountain that needs to bubble up more and more and more. It's a present active subjunctive that you may keep, that love may keep overflowing, bubbling up like a fountain. That love, by the way, is given to you a regeneration along with faith. And so it is by faith that you are justified, but the faith by which you are justified works through love. It's a faith that has love built into it. And so the assumption that Paul is making here is that everyone who has believed with a justifying faith also has divine love put into their soul, planted into their soul by the Spirit of God. You have love. Now, and so he is saying, you need to make progress. You need to make progress. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 13, he, he talks about himself. And he shows that he himself needs to make a lot of progress in love. He says, not that I have already obtained, obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that, which, uh, of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the, for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I got a lot to grow in my love, he is saying. And if Paul has to grow, how about you and I? Nobody ever gets there, not in this life, because what did Jesus say we had to love like? He said, you shall be perfect. As your Father in heaven is perfect. So you can always pray for your brother, your sister. You can always pray for them to abound more and more, to grow in their love. There's always room to grow. Always. And so, love, the most important thing. Now, love has one grace that feeds it, and one other grace that defends it. It's like, a, it's like a growing, thriving city that has to have a good source of, of food, good farmers, and also a good army. One block, the farmers are tasked with feeding the city, and then you have the other group, the soldiers, who are tasked with defending the city. Both of them are absolutely necessary. You can't do without those two. And so, in the same way, love has one grace that feeds it, that nourishes it, that makes it grow, and has another grace that defends it. So let's look at the one that feeds it, and that is real knowledge. I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge. The word for Real knowledge there is just one in the Greek, epignosko, a combination of epi and gnosko. It's a, uh, we might even say super knowledge, but rather the actual translation is precise and correct knowledge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 17, Paul uses it for full knowledge as opposed to partial knowledge. And so we have to ask the question, so knowledge of what? What are you talking about? You need to grow in, in knowledge, but knowledge of what? And the answer to that is knowledge of what God has done for you. Knowledge of the way God has loved you. This is the same thing that he will say in Philippians chapter 3 
and verse 18, and he is praying again, and he says that, I, I pray that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. What you need to have knowledge about is God's love and God's works on your behalf, His predestination of you, His election, His electing love before the foundation of the world, setting His affection on you, His atonement in time, sending His own Son so that you might have life, His calling in time so that you might hear the gospel and follow Him and might believe. So therefore, you're also praying to understand His justifying love, His justification, and what it means to be adopted and ingrafted into his family and made royalty with him. You also need to understand his sanctifying power and his glorification, what lies ahead for us, which no eye has seen nor ear heard what is in store for you and I. And as we grow in our love and our, uh, I'm sorry, in our understanding of those things, then guess what? Our love begins to swell. We begin to grow in love. This is why Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, 47, He who is forgiven little, loves little. Now granted, all of us have been forgiven much. The problem is, do you know it? Do you know how much you've been forgiven? Do you know how much God has done for you? Because to the extent that you know, to that extent you will love. Therefore, love needs to be fed. And it needs to be fed through knowledge. This is why we come to church. This is why we spend time in private prayer and private meditation of the Bible. Because you grow in knowledge and knowledge breeds love. And so the, you have love on that. You have uh, love being nourished by, by, uh, by knowledge. But then you have another grace that defends it. And that is discernment. He says that you may love, may, uh, that your love may abound still more and more in all discernment. The, the word for discernment here is an interesting one. It's uh, only takes place, uh, only is used once in the Greek New Testament. In classic Greek, it was used for the ability to per per uh, perceive by the senses. So a person who could smell a dish, for example, and uh, would be able then to distinguish the different uh, ingredients that had been put into that dish. I know I'm making you all uh, hungry as you're thinking <laughs> through that. Uh, but a person who can smell the whole thing and then think that has tomatoes, that has uh, whatever other condiments. And uh, discernment, the word for discernment, that's what he's using. It's, it's sensitive moral perception. You can distinguish good and evil. Sometimes things come with good and evil. Can you separate the two? Are you able to discern? This is why uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon said that discernment is not so much understanding good versus evil, but right from almost right. Why do we need this? Well... Simple. Satan comes to us as an angel of light. Have you ever talked to somebody who tells you, that preacher, I thought she was uh, a heretic until I heard it. And then she was, she was preaching the Bible. She was, had a, all kinds of Bible verses. And you say to yourself, but of course, of course she did. Satan comes as an angel of light. We have to be discerning. We have to know what is right, what is wrong. Otherwise, we are led away from what? From sound doctrine. And what happens when you are led away from sound doctrine? The well of love gets stopped up. False teachers are always said to come into the church and sow division. Why? When they begin to teach, love stops. Love for neighbor stops and they are divided one against the other. And so the threat of false teaching is always a threat against love. Love for God, love for neighbor. That is what false doctrine does in your life. This is why we need to be discerning so that we can know false doctrine when we hear it. And are not so easily led astray. And so when you pray actually for other people, this is what Paul is doing here. He is praying to see them grow in love. 
And in order to see that, they also have to grow in knowledge, to feed that love, and in discernment, to defend that love. Now, that's, a, that's the immediate needs. Now, let's move on to the more long-term needs. Uh, we, we seek those things now in other people. And, and now, uh, uh, what is the long-term goal? That is in verse 10. So that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. The word for approving here is dokimazo. It's, a, it's a, a critical examination to determine genuineness. You, you, you test something, and once you determine that it is genuine, you approve it. You buy it. And what are we to buy? Well, the things that are excellent. Excellent here means the things that are of higher value. So you have to be able to distinguish what they are and then choose that which is of greater value. Mary, for example, is a good illustration. She is said to have chosen the good portion. When, Mary, when Martha, her sister, was working and saying, you need to help me in the kitchen, and she was rather sitting at the, at the feet of Jesus, Jesus says of Mary, she chose the good portion. What does that mean? It means of Mary that she had love and that she had, uh, she had knowledge. Right? She had knowledge of what Jesus did for her and that fed her love. And that made her make the right choice, choose the right portion. And so what are we doing this for? Well, he says, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. That's what you're looking for in other people. Sincerity and blameless until the day of Christ. The day of Christ, of course, is the day when we see Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes to snatch up his church and to take us, to introduce us to his father's house. That's the day when we all will be resurrected. And those, uh, those of us who have died and those of us who are still alive, will immediately be changed, will be glorified. And that's the next event in the pr prophetic calendar. We're not waiting for anything else except for Jesus to come and take his people. That's what, we're, that's what we're waiting for. And as we are waiting for, what are we looking for in our lives? Well, Paul says you're looking for each other to be sincere and blameless. The word for sincere here literally means judged by sunlight. It's an analogy of a, somebody who sells pottery, and what they would do is that they would, uh, broken pottery, they would fill in with, uh, with all kinds of things, uh, and, and they would paint that pottery. And, uh, and so the way to find out whether that pottery was genuine was simply to hold it up to the sun. And, and so this, it's, in, it's sincerity. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the love of other people to be a love that is without hypocrisy, that is genuine. You have a clear conscience. You're not double-minded. You are who you are everywhere you go. That's what you're looking for. And that's what you're looking for in others. But he says also blamelessness. That literally means without offense. So offense to who? Well, you're not offensive to God, right? Because you have sin in your life. You're not offensive to God because you're carrying all this the sin uh, of your life and you haven't laid it down at the feet of Jesus. So you're looking to be without offense, without offense to God, without offense to neighbors, as in somebody who lays a stumbling block before other saints and makes them scandalized. That's what we're looking for. Sincerity, blameless. Those are negative. But then he says, positively speaking, that we're looking for a life that has been, by the time Jesus comes back, has been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ. Notice again the principle there, that the fruit of righteousness, that which is good, comes through Jesus Christ. Not, it doesn't come from us, but through him. Fruit of righteousness. What is that? Well, it's simply divine grace in the soul. And the effects that it brings. In Proverbs 11.30 says that the, the one who is, who is righteous is like a tree of life. You can get close to him and the fruit that he bears is good fruit. You are edified by him. You are built up by him. You are helped by him. Because the fruit that he bears is life. He is life giving. Have you ever gotten close to other people and you realize, wow, every time I walk away from this person... 
It tastes funny. It, it, the, the fruit that is coming out of this person is fleshly. It's slanderous. It's wrong. It's fleshly. And I, don't, I, I, I can't be around this. Well, the, the fruit of the righteous is, is the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. The, the idea there goes back to Psalm 1, Psalm 92. Uh, in, in Psalm 1 in particular, you have the, the righteous man who's like a tree that gives his fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. But how does he give off that fruit? Well, he's planted by the streams of water. And so who is the stream of water? It's the Holy Spirit. And it is Jesus himself who comes to us by his spirit. And so when you are abiding in the vine, when you are close to Jesus, you are abiding by a stream of water. And things begin to come out of your life that are good. It's like spending a lot of time with a certain friend. You begin to look like them. You begin to act like them. And to the extent that they are godly, you will be godly. And in the same way, when you spend a lot of time with Jesus, good flows out of your life. And the goal here is that, hey, on the day of Christ, you want to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. You might remember in the parable of the soils that Jesus said, there's all these kinds of people. And he says, the soil that was ready, that received the seed, bore fruit. And he says, some were 30-fold, some 60-fold. Some a hundredfold, that's God's decision. But they were all fruitful. They were all very fruitful. And so you want to get to the point of your life where you bore all the fruit that God granted you to bear. And that's what we're looking for. And so that brings me to the ultimate thing that we're looking for. As we're praying for other people, as we're looking for, uh, as we're interceding on their behalf, we're not only looking that they would grow in their love now so that they would, as they go through life, be bearing good fruit. But ultimately, what are we looking for? Well, that they would do, that they would do these things to the glory and the praise of God. That is, uh, again, in verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So the glory, as we know, is the, the, a display of uh, when all of the attributes of God are put together, when the attributes of God come together, the glory of God shines. And this is why everything is made for God's glory, because everything shows something of who God is. Even the reprobate at the end of his life, he is a demonstration of the endurance of God. He is also a demonstration of the justice of God. Nevertheless, there is something that brings even greater glory to God than a reprobate. And that is one who has been saved by grace and who has borne fruit. Why? Because in our lives, there is something of every one of the attributes of God. Not just his justice. Yes, it's justice because we sinned, but God took away our sin and put it on Jesus. And so his justice was satisfied. But you can also see something of the mercy of God there. There's no mercy of God to be shown so much in the reprobate because they just receive justice. They receive what they're due. But we don't, this, we don't get what we deserve. So the mercy of God shines in our lives. But what about the grace of God? Of course the grace of God. We've been adopted as children of God and we have been given all things for us. We have been made co-heirs with Jesus Christ. There's grace there is loving kindness. There's all of the attributes of God displayed in your life. The glory of God seen in your life. The glory of God seen in your life. And what does that produce? Glory? What's the next word? Praise. When the angels see at the end of the age what God did in you. When you see what God did in you and with you. Praise. Praise. Eternal praise. Praise to the one who did it all. Because again, even those good works, they didn't come from you. They came from Christ. The Jews in the Middle Persian Empire, they were facing extinction. Because an order had been issued that they should be massacred. That there should be genocide. 
And it's at that time that a Jew by the name of Mordecai tells his niece, Esther, that Providence had put her in the palace, that Providence had made her queen precisely so that she could intercede at that time for her people before the king. She had ascended to the throne, Mordecai said, for such a time as this. And similarly, you and I, we have been made co-heirs with Christ for such a time as this. To appear before the King of Kings on behalf of our brothers and sisters. So it is your duty to pray for others, to intercede for others. And it isn't just your duty, it's your privilege. Let's pray. Father, you have made us kings and queens. Such grace, we will spend all of eternity singing about, meditating about, and we will never exhaust the depths of that goodness that you have displayed in our lives. You have also given us the ministry of intercession that we can appear as priests before you on behalf of our brothers and sisters, on behalf of the lost. And we thank you. We pray that you would help us to be faithful in that. We pray for any who are among us who have not received the grace of adoption, who have not been justified and are still in their sin. Pray that you would give them this day to turn, to embrace Christ as Lord and Savior, to believe in His name, to have eternal life. We pray this in His name and for His glory. Amen. Amen. Now would you now